America's military steamroller is steadily grinding the enemy back to the Ruhr in the north and the Saar in the south. Through saint Savold, Lorraine headquarters of the enemy, the American Third Army pushes toward Germany. The hub of vital Saar roads, the town is scarred by enemy shells. To route the Wehrmacht, tanks roll in. This mammoth flaunts a Times Square nameplate. Now the troops swing toward Saarbrücken, 15 miles away. Nearing the German border, the battle grows grim and the guns take over. For the railroads linked to Saarbrücken's big marshalling yards, the Germans battle desperately. But bitter enemy counterattacks and mines strewn along the way fail to block the Allied advance. Up in the hills, captured Nazi guns now lob shells against their former German masters. This team fires a Nazi 88 millimeter monster. It doesn't take long for American crews to solve Nazi gun secrets or to work out methods for using Nazi instruments. The Wehrmacht kindly left plenty of shells for the guns. On the northern front, the American 9th Army crashes into Linney. For this vital rower bridgehead and road center, shelled constantly by the enemy, the ground troops fight grimly and win, pushing deeper into Germany. In war-torn London, spokesmen for millions of working people in allied countries start the machinery for February's World Trade Union Conference. Some have traveled around the globe to discuss problems of war and peace faced by labor everywhere. Sidney Hillman of America in a broadcast had urged German railway workers to cripple a Nazi military machine. Russian, British, and American leaders issue a conference call to underground labor chiefs. Sir Walter Citrine of Britain presents for consideration troublesome questions of production and reconstruction. The planning group adds still other topics to the agenda. Here, the biggest task is rebuilding the areas torn by enemy bombs. But the job of building for peace throughout the world is greatest of all. During the Western Front, Supreme Commander Eisenhower confers with Canadian General Crerar here in the north. Engineers erect their ingenious Bailey Bridge, vital for war along the waterways. These are Polish troops fighting in the Holland salient. Flamethrowers fling spectacular jets of fire over the wintry terrain. The general visits some wounded boys at a field hospital and signs up for the pretty nurses. Arriving at General Montgomery's headquarters here, General Eisenhower is equipped for battlefront mud. Top planners of allied military strategy, these two make historic decisions now for the massive push toward Berlin along the Western Front. <laughs> o 
Opening up the gates to the great port of Antwerp, the Allies score a major victory early this December. Now, fleets of ships like this American Liberty rush masses of supplies close to the Western Front. But freeing the approaches of the Skelt took a month's bitter fighting, and cruelest of all was the last great ship-to-shore battle on the west wall of Valkyran Island. Monster enemy coastal guns poured murderous fire on allied landing craft and escort ships here off the shore. Heavily armored alligators ferried marine commandos toward the land under a smoke screen. Dirty skies prevented plane support. Dozens of allied craft were hit, but others bored into shore with supplies and tanks to storm the German casements. It was tough going for international units of Norwegian, Belgian, and British beach fighters on Valkyran. Allied tanks tried to absorb wicked enemy fire until the last boats beached. The battle was grim and hot. For four hours here, picked forces fought expertly on both sides for every inch of ground. Covered by ground fire, the men raced in with grenades to blast pillboxes and gun posts. Swarming over the dikes, they battled a savage enemy dug in all along the seaside. Awaiting invasion since last spring, the enemy had rimmed Valkyran with guns, and the guns took their toll. For high courage, this battle will go down in history with Dieppe and Tarawa. Here on Valkyran, the international commandos crashed down the last bar to Antwerp. The enemy committed to a last-ditch stand, fought until scorching fire drove them from fortified houses. They had hoped to bottle up a major artery for Allied supplies, but hope for them ended when the Allies stormed Valkyran from the west, the south, and the east. Fanning out into the interior, the commandos fought along heavily mined roads and through forests to join the British driving up from Flushing and the Canadians pushing in from Beveland. They rounded up prisoners on the double quick, routing them from holdout positions. Across the broad Skelt estuary, all resistance ceased when the Nazi commander surrendered with his force. Valkyran, Beveland, and Breskins were in allied hands, and not a single Nazi cannon was left to threaten the sea door to Antwerp. With the Nazi guns out of action, the great port speeds supplies to Eisenhower's waiting armies on the Western Front. Convoys from America and every allied country are ready to come in as soon as the minesweepers clear the channel. Hunting mines in these waters invites death every second. Saved from German demolition by Belgian patriots, most of the port facilities are quickly restored. The first Allied convoy berths at Antwerp, and big cranes gently unload American supplies on the pier. After four dark long years, the harbor is lively again. The world's third largest port, Antwerp has a peacetime record of handling 80,000 tons of goods a day. Over these piers, Belgian patriots and American supply troops are hustling vast supplies for the big drive toward Berlin. Antwerp is settling an old score with her traditional enemy.